Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, who is Ms. Milizia Savic, who is a lawyer and legal advisor for Collect Active Center for the Development of Social Policies, which is a Belgrade-based NGO that provides free legal aid and representation um, for asylum seekers, refugees, homeless, and other vulnerable categories of the population in proceedings before state authorities. Additionally, Collect Active conducts research and, and documents violations of human rights at state borders along the so-called Balkan refugee routes within Serbia, Croatia, Macedonia, Romania, and Hungary. Without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to um, Ms. Savic to speak. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, tonight for this discussion. Uh, my name is Milica Špabić. I'm a lawyer in an organization called Click Active, and I have my colleague uh, Vuk Vučković uh, here with me. Vuk is a social worker, so he will also uh, join in maybe during the discussion. Um, so also if you have any questions for him, feel free to, to type them in the chat box. Um, as um, Sam has already said, so the Balkan refugee route has been um, off the media and off the radar for the last uh, couple of years. In 2015, we had this big uh, welcoming policy towards the refugee when the Balkan refugee route was uh, open, when the border crossings were tolerated and organized by the state uh, authorities starting from Greece all the way to Germany. And then in March 2016, uh, this uh, humanitarian corridor was closed and the media presented the picture of uh, people not going through this, this route anymore. Um, on those rare occasions when uh, the Balkan refugee route was actually in the media, the focus was placed on Greece. Uh, and the problems that people are facing there, the pushbacks to Turkey, but also access to the territory and access to asylum in Greece. Uh, and it uh, presented a, as if this was the, the main obstacle that people are facing on their route, that after they reach the mainland of Greece, that everything further on is quite easy for them to, to cross. However, that's not the case in practice. Uh, people, uh, it is of course difficult to reach uh, mainland of Greece or Bulgaria, but then also people get stuck both in Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina, who are the final non-EU countries on the Balkan refugee route. Um, the state policies, but also the policy of uh, the European Union seems like they want to make both Serbia and Bosnia as a buffer zone uh, for refugees where they will get stuck and where they will not have access to re-enter the territory of the European Union. Uh, what we see on the ground, so um, as was already said, we are an organization based in Belgrade, but we go on a weekly basis to the north borders. Um, Serbia has three borders with European Union countries, so it borders with Croatia, with Hungary and Romania. And all these three countries are, uh, there is a route that leads through all of these uh, countries. Um, our organization, we go to these informal settlements, the so-called squats alongside the North borders. So Serbia has 19 state camps that are run by the state authority, but the capacities of these uh, camps are not sufficient to support the number of people on the move who are currently in Serbia but also due to other circumstances, people uh, don't want to be in these camps and instead they choose to be in these squads. Our organization at the moment counts how many? 30, 31 squads alongside uh, the border. Uh, these squads, they count anywhere between 30 and 500 people uh, at the time. People in these squads, this is their temporary home while they're in Serbia. So they uh, live here, eat here, uh, and they're going on a game or they try to cross the borders from these places. The current trend is that the number of people on the move in Serbia is uh, increasing. Uh, throughout this whole year, we are noticing the constant increase in the number of people. Um, this hasn't changed uh, with the cold weather, which um, some of us expected that it might well, that it will keep people in other countries or that it will keep them in the camp and not in these uh, squads. 
However, that's not the case. We still have a lot of number of people in the squad. We have a lot of women, a lot of children on the company and minors uh, who are staying in these, in these conditions. Um, in the last couple of months, there was also a lot of talk in the EU about visa-free regime that Serbia has with certain countries, with uh, Tunisia, Egypt, Burundi, uh, India and Cuba, because there is an increase in the number of people coming from these countries. However, according to our data, they make only 90% of the people that our organization reaches. The rest are still people from Syria, from Afghanistan. They together make around 70% of people on the move here. And then also there is a lot of people from other Maghreb countries, from Morocco, Algeria, um, other African countries like Somalia, Sudan, Pakistan as well. Um, so definitely the numbers are not going up only because of the visa-free regime. Uh, after the pressure from the European Union, uh, Serbia now reintroduced visa for people from uh, Tunisia and uh, starting from January next year, people from Burundi will also need a uh, visa in order to travel to Serbia. What we see is that majority of people are still coming from Syria and from Afghanistan. Uh, from Afghanistan, they're coming because of the situation in their home country, because of the Taliban took over the government and the power in the country. And we see a lot of Syrians who are coming directly from Syria, but also a lot of them are, uh, they left Syria five, six, 10 years ago, and they spend all of this time in Turkey. And because the Turkey changed its policy, towards the Syrian refugees, now they are moving uh, towards the Europe. We also see a lot of, we see a very big increase in the number of uh, women and children. A lot of them, they, their husbands are already in the European Union, but because of the strict policies, they couldn't do the family reunification. So now the wife and children started this journey on their own so that they can join their uh, husbands and spouses. Uh, in general, uh, some of the novelties that we have here in Serbia, the situation is changing quite, quite drastically and quite quickly, not only in the number of people, but also uh, the policies of the Serbian government and as well the involvement of the European Union here. Um, Serbian government on one side is uh, presenting itself to be a good partner of the European Union, that they will play this role of being a buffer zone and keeping people here. So they uh, receive a lot of money for accommodating refugees in Serbia. Only recently they received more than uh, 360 million of euros for the camps and accommodation facilities here. Uh, but then on the other side, Serbian government doesn't want people to actually stay here. So majority of people don't have access to asylum procedure here. Uh, in many police stations, they refuse to register uh, people. For example, all police stations on the north of Serbia, in all of the larger cities on the north, uh, they refuse to register people. They uh, tell them they have to go to Belgrade, which is not that close and not that easy to organize. Um, also in Belgrade, very often they would be sent away and the police refuses to do the registration. People are getting fake information in the camp, in the state-run uh, camps about their statutes, about their rights and obligations while they're here. Uh, they're issued with these um, temporary cards, which are not actually uh, part of any legislation. And then people believe that they are asylum seekers when in fact they are not. Um, so through this, this type of behavior, Serbian police and uh, Serbian government is sending a very clear message to the people that they are not welcome here, that they will not have a protection here. And that practically the only way uh, that they have is to try going on again over and over again until they succeed. On the other side, the pushbacks from the EU external borders are happening on a daily basis. At the moment, majority of people are trying to reach uh, Western Europe through Hungary. Uh, also, the border with Croatia and Romania is still active, but not as it was before. Um, people now in Serbia are also extremely codependent on smugglers. So this whole 
policy that the EU and Serbia are imposing is actually benefiting only the smuggling networks. We're getting bigger and uh, more rich. Uh, people now have to uh, pay smugglers to stay in Serbia, to stay both in the, uh, in the official camps there are smugglers, uh, in the squats, in private accommodation, private hostels, so everywhere. They have to pay smugglers in order to stay here in Serbia, to get them food, to organize transportation, uh, so for anything, but then also they have to pay a very big amount of money to cross the border. According to the information that we are getting from the field, the border crossing from Serbia to Vienna, so to cross through Hungary, costs up to 5,000 euros, which is an extremely high amount of money. Uh, this also leads to a lot of um, crime acts happening in, in Serbia. So not just, uh, it's not a matter just of uh, illegal border crossing, but also there is a lot of human trafficking, a lot of sex work, a lot of labor exploitation, and, the, and other different kinds of, of mistreatment of people on the move. Uh, besides uh, Serbia national policies towards the people on the move, we now see a lot of influence coming from the EU uh, into the Serbia. Uh, since last year, Frontex uh, is present in Serbia, although we are not a member of the European Union. Uh, officially, they are present only at the border with Bulgaria, which is in the last couple of months the main uh, point of entry when it comes to, to the migration movement, but also through their social media, uh, they publish that they are also present at the border with uh, Macedonia. Besides Frontex, there are also other foreign police forces who are present uh, on these borders. We saw uh, German police, Austrian police, Hungarian police. There is also this cooperation that is happening uh, currently between Serbia, Austria, and Hungary. I think currently some of the state officials are here because the all around the Belgrade you can see the flags of uh, Hungary and Austria, where they want to to join forces in uh, shifting the this protection line, how they call it, even further to the south, and then instead of um, focusing on Serbian-Hungarian border, they want to focus on the Macedonian-Serbian uh, border. So there is now Hungarian and Austrian police who are present uh, on the border between uh, Macedonia and Serbia, trying to prevent people from entering uh, Serbia. Serbia also now follows the trend of other EU countries and started building the border fence. Although our president in 2015 declared that we will never do that, that we will never build fences for, for people in need. Still, uh, EU is now financing the border fence at the border with Macedonia. And it seems like, according to some information that we have from last month, uh, the Serbian government is also preparing the land alongside the border with Bulgaria to build a fence there as well. Uh, not just that um, EU is giving money for accommodation for the camps here and for the uh, Frontex, for foreign uh, police, for border fences, but also in the last uh, year, EU funded building two new detention centers in Serbia. So at the moment, Serbia has three detention centers. We had one, and now with the help of the European Union, we have two more, uh, which also, according to some in unofficial information that we're receiving, are quite full. Uh, so th those would be some of the general overview about the situation uh, here. I think Carolina will speak more about the situation in, in Bosnia, uh, but we can also um, overlook uh, later during the, the questions and answers about the, the situation there as well. So I will stop for now and uh, maybe give a floor to, to Carolina. And of course, if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to type them in the chat and I will be more than happy to answer. Thank, Thank you. you so, so much, uh, Melitia. That's been very helpful and very informative. Um, I will want to introduce uh, Dr. Gostova. Dr. Karolina Ogostova joined Northumbria University in September of 2022 as a lecturer in international relations and sociology. 
Before that, uh, she was an ESRC postdoctoral fellow at Aston University. Um, her work as um, it looked at the European Union's migration externalization in Bosnia-Herzegovina and the Kurdish region in Turkey and border violence and human smuggling. And so without any further ado, uh, Dr. Gustova, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone can uh, hear me and see the presentation. Sanas, can you give me some feedback if you can see the presentation? Okay, perfect. I can see it, yes. I can see thumb up. Great. Uh, I'm just going to move my screen for a little bit. Sorry about it. So, hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Sanas, for including me into the workshop. Uh, for me, this theme is a little bit going back in, in time because uh, in my latest research, I'm more looking at Kurdish region and Eastern Turkey, where I lived for almost a year uh, last year. Uh, but uh, during my PhD, I was spending some time in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and, and the topic of my PhD was focus on border violence there. I mean, you can see this leaflet or this poster that was created by my friend Jack Sapo from the Border Violence Monitoring Network community. Uh, the pink country portrays Bosnia-Herzegovina, and these kind of stripes are pointing to what uh, Marta, who is here as well, uh, would call a circular movement, where people are being pushed from one country to another. They are moving, always searching for new alternative ways. Um, well, also, I'm trying to, what I will do is not to point to what's happening in Bosnia-Herzegovina right now in terms of up-to-date information, uh, but more contextualize what we have been seeing uh, in the Western Balkans as uh, people call the region, especially in Europe and in the West. Um, and it's something that is summarized in my book that is forthcoming in 2023 with Routledge. And it's titled Games, Pushbacks and Everyday Violence at the Bosnian Croatian Border. Uh, Milica mentioned that games refers to how people on the move call their uh, border crossing attempts. When I was doing some interviews with people, they often pointed out that if you try to cross the border, you either win everything or you lose and you have to start again and again and you have to understand the strategy. Uh, you have to collaborate with others and know how to navigate very complex security that Milica very rightly pointed out in Serbia. Uh, well, on this photo, you can see uh, makeshift camp in Velika Kladusha, which is a border town in uh, northern Bosnia, very close to Croatian border. The camp doesn't exist anymore, uh, but it existed almost uh, one year. Uh, I was living just next to or very close to the camp and everyday volunteering in this place uh, with No Name Kitchen, uh, but also with Border Violence Monitoring Network, which I mentioned, and which is the organization who is trying to track pushbacks, uh, which is activist-led organization, trying to make pushbacks across Europe, uh, especially, but it has been also some work done in Eastern Turkey and elsewhere. Uh, I was also volunteering with some local volunteers, uh, SOS Velika Kladusha, and uh, a restaurant that was run by war veterans and that was providing every day around 80 dishes uh, to people on the move who live in this camp. At the peak of this camp, uh, there were around 800 people living. I mean, the conditions of the former camps, uh, as Milica also said, there was, especially at the beginning, not too much space in formal camps. In Bosnia-Herzegovina, it was be even more preca precarious, I would say, in terms of spaces in former accommodations. A majority of people were squatting, uh, sleeping in camps like this. First of all, sleeping publicly, being homeless, but afterwards being moved outside of the public spaces and squares into fields like this or, or places that are a little bit away from, from the public. Um, well, the themes I want to present are very much following some of the major key themes uh, of my book. Uh, and it's about where this violence actually takes place when we are talking about the Balkans and the Balkan route, the way how often Western uh, media politicians, but also European politicians imagine uh, Balkans, uh, the way consequently they also try to govern the Balkans. And it's important to understand some of the regional histories and social dynamics. Um, also, it's important to question who does this violence target and often race uh, as not a biological character, of course, which has been proved as being absolutely fault and non-existent, but as a social category, and also gender, how these two categories play or even predict for the violence often. 
And uh, Melissa, Melissa already talked about pushbacks. We know that this involves direct and often brutal uh, use of excessive force by especially EU-funded border guards in Croatia, for example. Uh, still, I want to come back to this term and uh, divide it a little bit or discuss it um, for a bit. And after, uh, I want to move away from this direct, visibly uh, visible and extraordinary force that we often discuss, especially in Western Balkans, uh, during pushbacks into the everyday life at the border. Because importantly, people are experiencing the pushbacks and they're stranded at borders for months or even years. I mean, I was in the border in Velika Kladusha 2018, 2019. Uh, and uh, I know some people who are at the border in the same location until today. So this is very much a continuation of something that has been ongoing, right? Uh, well, I am going back a little bit into the theory and analysis, so I hope you'll excuse me that this is not going to be very much focused on uh, uh, information uh, in terms of descriptions of, of now. But you know, when we speak about the Balkans, uh, usually there is a um, Bulgarian historian, Maria Todorova, who kind of said that uh, Western world or Europe in general imagined Balkans in a specific way based on how uh, European travelers in 18th century kind of traveled to South Southeastern Europe and name or uh, affiliated the region, uh, the name the Balkan, which uh, afterwards it was framed or abused by Western politicians often uh, trying to point to the Balkans or Southeastern Europe as a place that was untouched by Western enlightenment uh, and backward. Uh, often also the politicians were, especially in Europe, uh, using this reference to justify or explain uh, or simplify the causes of wars in the 20th century arguing that violence has been inherently Balkan or caused by the region's predicaments and people, which of course is absolute nonsense. But I, why I'm mentioning it is because uh, I noticed that uh, often international even volunteers or Frontex, UNHCR, IOM, the way how they've been narrating border violence is often coming back to these narratives simplifying them uh, and basically portraying them as happening in the Western Balkans rather uh, being outsourced there by the EU policymakers and by the EU's violence policies. Well, I want you to use this quote by one international volunteer who told me in Sarajevo when she arrived there that she was not really surprised uh, that the pushbacks and violence was happening there because this is Balkans. And, uh, you know, of course, this is very problematic and it needs to be acknowledged uh, that, uh, again, this is not a Balkan violence. This is a violence that has been outsourced to the region and uh, the local people or the region itself doesn't really have anything to do with it in terms of its production. Um, I think that when we are looking on the responses on the ground uh, by local residents, especially in the beginning in 2018 in Bosnia-Herzegovina, most of the refugees would tell you that when they arrive to places like Velika Kladusha, they receive a huge amount of support and aid, huge solidarity. They felt to some extent safe in Velika Kladusha, although the asylum procedures are very much similar to what Milica described, impossible administratively. So most people, the vast majority, were not able to seek asylum and seek legal protection, so they were compelled to move on. But still, I think that, uh, you know, for example, the project of a uh, restaurant by war veterans in Velika Kladusha, who are often saying uh, the, the man who was running it, well, no one died in Kladusha during the war, so no one will die of hunger uh, right now. And very much uh, this was a slogan that turned into reality. On the one hand, we have neighboring country Croatia that has been greatly accused of pushbacks and, and violence. However, Croatia has joined the EU uh, in January, or sorry, yes, in January next year is going to join Schengen Zone uh, for its uh, great work of protecting the EU's external border. Often Croatian authorities state uh, that um, they have been Europeanized by joining the EU. They're right now more part of the democratic liberal center of Europe. Uh, however, you can very much see that often the violence, uh, uh, when they were saying that the violence that more like belongs to the Balkans or the, to the countries that are very much still far away from joining the EU, 
In contrast, the Croatian state authorities were specifically engaging in this violence. And the regional histories were also playing some factor. For example, uh, this man from Iraq said that as he was intercepted in Croatia, uh, he revealed that he was a Muslim and the police officers or border officers uh, reacted uh, in a bad way, in a sense, started insulting him, kicking into his legs and saying that Muslims killed his cousin during the war. And this is what triggered attacks. So I think, did you know why the EU is often at the center and it should be, especially in a way how it's diffusing its values into different countries and borders, we still have to acknowledge the regional histories. Well, of course, uh, the countries in Southeastern Europe, especially those who haven't joined the EU yet, are going through the EU stabilization process. I think Marta, uh, who is here present, have written quite greatly, Nijara also in her reports about what this EU stabilization process is, what it does with the countries, in Southeastern Europe, of course, that they have to adopt the EU migration policies and start collaborating on combat against so-called illegal migration and organized crime, namely people smuggling. Well, I think also the part of the EU stabilization process is often at the center that the Southeastern European countries should clean its past traces of violence, especially during the Yugoslav wars send the war criminals into the uh, international tribunal and so on. However, I think that you know this needs to be put into good contrast that at the same time, uh, these countries are encouraged to use violence policies against refugees, asylum seekers, migrants to prove its rightful place uh, and position in Europe or the center of the European Union. So you can see that this narrative of what violence is actually barbaric or what is liberal and so forth, acknowledged or even encouraged. Uh, again, it's quite important here. I think what we saw in Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, especially with the issue with the EU and how it started responding was that most of the funds and the money were not really given to the local initiatives and local residents who were greatly responding to migration. Uh, but to international organizations, namely the IOM, which established formal camps, which uh, were very much problematic in uh, many uh, ways in terms of enclosure of people, trying to prevent their movement and going on the games, uh, unacceptable conditions in, inside and so forth. Also the use of violence against the people by private security who was operating uh, in these camps, resulting even in the cases of deaths. Um, well, refugees became very much harassed at some point, especially uh, the change from 2018 to 2019 when the squads were evicted. The makeshift camp uh, that I showed on the front page was demolished and people were moved to these formal camps, often even forcibly. Um, uh, I think that, you know, also uh, the aid by local residents was often, often criminalized. There was a local woman, for example, in Kladusha, who was hosting minors in her house. And after one day, she said that the police uh, visited, visited her and told her that she has to pay fee 2,000 euros for hosting illegal migrants. Uh, so I think there was a definitely specific environment that changed quite drastically. Uh, but you could see that this was pressured from Brussels, especially and from neighboring Croatia under the assumptions that uh, formalized aid uh, in the name of security has to step in to prevent people trying the games. I think also it's important to question who this violent targets. Milica said, interestingly, that most people or many people are women and children who are coming to Serbia. But in 2018, uh, there, these were mainly men this not, is not the case that the women and children would not migrate. But as Melissa kind of pointed out, often the women and children that time stayed in Turkey, in Greece, in more safer transit zone, and basically relied on the men to make the journey to Europe under the assumption that they will be after formally reunified through programs that have ever failed, as Melissa said. I think that often, you know, violence was used against women and children likewise, However, this was not so greatly extensive as in terms of brutal use of violence and even the instances of torture as against men. 
I think you can definitely see that there is some discrepancy between masculinity and vulnerability. Often men are perceived as default figures in refugee system and not rightfully seeking protection and so on. Often these men would be called single uh, as traveling without women and children. However, this doesn't mean they were already single. I mean, as I said before, they had uh, families who were waiting for them in different transit locations. I think I wanted to just use some example of what I mean by uh, by this here. Well, for example, there was this interview with a woman from Iran who said that as they were being pushed back from Croatia to Bosnia Herzegovina, uh, the police officers took all single men on the side and started beating them. These were often instances when women and children were attacked. Often this was when they were trying to protect their friends uh, or their male family members. Um, uh, also, I think that there were some cases when the men's injuries were not so much attracting the attention as, of course, the women's and children's uh, instances of violence. Uh, for example, there was this anonymous lawyer who wanted to pick up some litigation case uh, in Velika Kladusha and put it to the court uh, and persecute it or try to proceed with it. But she said she didn't want to open the case with a man because uh, it uh, wouldn't cause probably so much empathy. And it could not be, or it wouldn't be so much successful as this person believed, like the case of child and a woman. Of course, we know that border violence is very racist, is targeting people who are especially non-white. Uh, I think that, you know, the opening borders for Ukrainian refugees in Southeastern Europe at the same borders where uh, the same border officers are pushing non-white refugees away. There is a very much, this doesn't have to be too much argued further. Um, well, there have been often these narratives, you know, that the border patrols or policymakers or politicians make in statements that we need to defend our way of European life and Christianity, which is often drawing on just colonial ideas that survived colonial, colonialism until today and they're deeply racist. I think sometimes we found cases of uh, people who, uh, for example, like this person from Tunisia who said that he was attacked. But the moment when he started calling for Jesus and saying Christian prayer, the officers stopped attacking him and basically let him go. I, I think that often people understood that uh, they wanted to mask their Muslim or non-European uh, identities in a way that men often would shave their beard as they were going on a game or wearing a crucifix around their neck uh, to kind of try to persuade the guards, you know, that uh, they were not Muslims or they were non-Arab and so forth. Um, well, I think that definitely there is this argument by Ghani that speaks to that, that the more people try to distance, distance themselves from the notion of an Oriental Arab Muslim non-white person, or uh, the more chance they have to escape their imagined racial backwardness, right, and the border violence in these cases as well. I think that moving to the pushback as a strategy, uh, of course, we know that these practices are orchestrated by the EU, uh, by its assistance through funds and also material assistance, but also coordination and collaboration. But often when we are speaking about pushbacks, the definition goes as people are denied asylum and after they are forcibly moved over a border with the use of violence. However, I think that it's also important to mention that uh, not only asylum seekers are uh, subjected to pushbacks. There are many people who uh, would not seek asylum or who want to transit the country, who want to move forward. Uh, but I don't think that that should be justification that they should be, of course, attacked or hurt at the borders. Uh, I think that also it's good to divide push back into two stages of push when uh, the border guards use direct violence often that inflicts pain to people immediately. Uh, it's quite visible, it's happening in the EU territory, but after what's happening uh, to people when they are back, uh, back again in non-EU zone is a bit different uh, and it's continuing and it's also part of the pushback, right? It's also part of the border violence that people are experiencing and that more functions in less direct forms uh, that especially in makeshift camps when people are denied uh, material aid or medical attention. Um, and uh, both of these strategies, although they rely on different forms of violence, they happen in different places, they have different perpetrators, they have the same objective 
to lock people out of the EU territory to prevent their further movement. Uh, as we said before, I think that uh, it's, this is something that is ongoing. People experience all the time. Usually they go on a game, they're pushed back. They say, I will have a rest for a few days. And again, I'm, I try again. Um, well, I think Melissa mentioned that uh, the push is uh, often connected to destruction of people's private possessions under assumptions that uh, if people don't have functional phone, they can no more communicate with smugglers, they can no more use Google Maps, it's difficult for, to, for, for them to keep moving. Uh, and it's also connected to beatings and uh, many different ways of direct violence that people refer to tunnel tricks, combis, zigzag and all different names that often point to the strategies that the border guards use as in a sense of, for example, creating a tunnel with their bodies and people had to pass through it while the border guards were beating them or combis when people were enclosed in, uh, in police vans with a lack of oxygen for several hours or uh, the patrols would put all people into the van and after they would drive with them really quickly moving from one side to another, the people were falling from one side to another. So this would be called zigzags. Uh, people were also put into different stress positions. They were electroshocked, stripped naked. Uh, and also they will be pushed into rivers, for example, especially freezing rivers in the winter uh, when of course, Bodegas didn't have to use too much force because the nature did that for them. In the camps afterwards, people are, of course, often uh, struggling to access basic material aid. Uh, I think that's funny thing uh, to point uh, in the case of Velika Kladusha and the Ternovi camp, that IOM was actually present in the camp, but they didn't provide any assistance. Uh, only assistance they provided at the time, especially in 2018, was voluntary return. So we could actually frame it as waiting for people to be exhausted after several pushbacks and the life in the camps. And after the IOM made a strategic choice, let's say, to provide aid. But of course, this aid is for a very security purpose to lock people even for, further away from the territory to return them back home. These were people from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, uh, also from North African countries, uh, Iraq. Uh, so there were very different nationals who were deported at that time, especially in 2018 and 19, or voluntarily re returned, let's say. But on the other hand, of course, uh, you could see and you keep seeing uh, various initiatives, NGOs like Click Active, uh, local residents, and many different people coming to the borders and try to build from makeshift camps to some extent, at least, uh, some pieces of home, some pieces of safety where people at least can stay uh, for temporary time. And uh, the last thing I want to point, uh, point to is the everyday life. I think that uh, um, this is very rightly shown in this quote by one of the men from Afghanistan who told me that it would be better if he died in Afghanistan than everyday dying here at the border inside. The physical pain at the border does not matter too much, but you know, being at the border and in this camp every day matters. I think that it quotes, you know, leads to some of the issues uh, that are not usually noticed, not immediately, or they are not viewed as so ex extraordinary and uh, important to pay attention to. But from what I observed, especially across the year of being uh, at the border, almost a year, there has been this certain sense of normalization of violence. Uh, when people started perceiving to some extent some of the violence as normal, as happening, uh, as uh, they basically tried to get used to it, not because they wanted to, but because of the some of the coping and survival mechanisms that allowed them to stand up and try the game again. Um, definitely the cycle of border violence affected the way how people created relations, how they navigated their daily routines, uh, rituals, and also it generated a great instance of self-harm, uh, especially drug addiction, um, uh, attempts for committing suicide, and so on. Um, I think especially in the book, uh, in the final chapter, I point to one case of a guy from uh, who was born in Libya and uh, who died at the border uh, after I left Bosnia-Herzegovina. His name was Yusef. And when, as he died, the police, when they discovered his body, uh, they said that they found no traces of violence on his body and they labeled his death as nonviolent. 
However, as I knew Yusef for almost eight months, uh, he talked to so many instances of pushbacks, of injuries, of life in squats, uh, during which he developed addiction on drugs. Uh, and one day he overdosed in a squat and he died. And this, viol this death was very much portrayed as nonviolent. And I think that when we look at the everyday life at the border, we can recognize that the violence definitely played its role and that killed that person quite slowly. Um, just to conclude, I think that, you know, when we are speaking about border violence and pushbacks as academics or as anyone who is interested in the topic and who is trying to follow it, while, of course, the EU is at the center of one of the discussions, there are also play specific analysis in terms of regional history and social dynamics of local people who are just living at the border and who are often involved in migration responses. Uh, and that matters in the way how migration routes are imagined, but also governed and uh, how the everyday life evolves there. It's also important to, of course, produce counter narratives uh, and generative aspects. Uh, I think that, you know, most of the game players eventually reach their final destination, at least from people I know or I met along the route, while the pull factors uh, and the game as they were trying it often were stronger than the pushbacks. So these policies are not just extremely expensive, uh, it's cost human lives and, and it's against the human rights violations, of course, uh, or it it's, uh, leads to human rights violations, but also they're dysfunctional. They don't work. Uh, most of the people make these journeys. Um, also, it's important to highlight, I think, that the border violence, border violence monitoring initiatives are usually um, done by people on the move themselves, who sometimes put themselves into great danger to collect some of the evidence of pushbacks as they are being pushed back, who then pass it uh, to the activists, NGOs, spread it forward uh, and further. And these initiatives definitely create cracks in border injustice or trying to uh, go against these narratives. And the final thing when we are talking about the everyday at the border is that the visible and extraordinary violence often produces something that is quite invisible and ordinary uh, that can harm people or even kill them. And these are equally some stories that uh, we have to uh, pay attention to. So I will leave it here and uh, we can discuss a bit more during the discussion, but thank you for your attention and looking forward to the questions and answers. Thank you so much, Carolina. That was a very informative. Um, I learned so much. So thank you again. And again, thank you to Mritzia. Um, I will open the floor for questions. Are there any questions? Um, if you want to put it in the chat box. Maybe I'd like to do this. Um, is do you, um, Malizia, do you have any questions for Carolina? <laughs> or vice versa? Uh, no, I, I would have I would have a question, but uh, I don't know have I understood it uh, very good. Uh, what does the term debalkanization means? Is it like uh, and because it's in the same sentence with Europeanization, does that mean that Balkans should become more Europe or something else? And that we are not Europe? <laughs> no, I mean, it's a critic of that, right? Because often uh, the Europeanization should be put probably like an EU Europeanization when, for, for example, Croatia, you know, often says, well, you know, we are not the Balkans because we are the EU zone and we have Europeanized our policies. And of course, this is nonsense, right? Even yeah. the idea of the Balkans that is not part of Europe uh, is has absolutely no proof, and it's just a cultural imagination that is often abused by policymakers and especially Brussels uh, when trying to reportray the route as a criminal route or as a problematic route, as a place full of illegal migration. So I think that you know this debalkanization is supposed to be more in like a quote quotes because of course Southeastern Europe is part of yeah. Europe. Debalkanization, uh, yeah, sorry, debalkanization sounds like the worst thing that can happen to someone <laughs> in the Balkans. Like, yeah, 
But I think for uh, making discussions about like the cultural cultural imaginations that are very much racist and that are excluding the Balkans, you know, from Europe or that are trying to justify some of the narratives that the Balkan has been backward and so forth, it needs to the EU surveillance and the governance and so on. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, the, when we are reconstructing the, the Balkanization and Europeanization, I think it can help to understand uh, why these policymakers think that way and how wrong it is. So it's definitely not a quote that I'm promoting. It's something that I'm critiquing. critiquing. I hope you understood it. <laughs> no, no, yeah, yeah. But uh, I was just uh, shocked with the word. <laughs> I never heard it before. I think if you would read the work by uh, Rishepi or Maria Todorova or some of the regional actually historians or theorists, they often use and engage with the critique based on Balkanization, the Balkanization, Europeanization, when they try to reconstruct how the West often imagines the region and how it tries to govern it, especially through violence or uh, racist policies. Yeah, and... Uh, oh, okay, so... But yeah, that's... Saying, mm -hmm. sorry. We, we do have another question. It's a question by um, Anna in the chat box. Um, she goes, how narrative men quote, men should be strong, end quote, especially uh, related to refugees can be challenged or uh, changed by people, writers, individuals, activists. Um, I'll, I'll pose that question to both of you, um, Melitia and Carolina. Well, if you want to respond, Melitia, I just talk and after I can jump in. Let's just see, Leon. Um, how the narrative men should be strong, especially related to refugees, can be changed by people. Um, I think what uh, Carolina also mentioned, this whole narrative of having um, these are all single men, where are their women and children, is a big part of this, of this problem. Um, everything that Carolina already uh, talked about during her presentation. So I think that First, that part of the narrative has to be uh, changed. Uh, the issue is should not be if these are uh, men or women, these are all refugees. Both, of, both genders have the same and equal rights to seek protection in other countries and to escape the war. Um, so I think that part of the topic uh, has to be changed uh, first. But then this, uh, this construction of men should be strong and they're the ones who are on the road, who are going first to secure the safety and then they will uh, bring their, their women and children uh, is something that's coming directly from uh, how they were raised, how they see uh, themselves. Uh, so that's also some of the burden that they have to, yeah. um, to meet. I mean, yeah. I wanted to say, yeah, it's much broader than, than just a refugee crisis. It's uh, the burden of patriarchy. And, uh, you know, men should be strong is, is like uh, one of the po main postulates in, in, in patriarchy. And uh, I don't know how exactly it can be, it can be changed so, so fast and in such a narrow narrow space like like it's uh, it's uh, the, the field work you know but uh, but for example in our work when we speak with people we encourage people to to you know if if it's safe for them if we see that it is safe for them to express their emotions and to to feel free to to speak about uh, whatever whatever you know uh, bothers them in that moment, but uh, I really think that it's much, much uh, uh, that it's, it's it's a problem which which will be addressed for next uh, fifty years at least. You know, uh, the 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 quote men should be strong. I mean, I hope that I that I was understood in my head. I was <laughs> in my head. I was good, but in your head it makes sense. Yeah. Carolina, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think that, you know, it's not just about that men should be strong, that it's projected only to migration security, but it's projected to any kind of security that we are observing. And it's like connected to not only migration or refugee movements, but the way how societies think. So it's something much broader. It should be definitely challenged in 
more spheres than just migration. If if this changes, it will not change only in migration, but in other spheres of security, possibly. Um, yeah, and I think that pointing to vulnerabilities that definitely uh, are related to any people, right, who are moving, not just based on gender, not based on race. Uh, but at the same time, I think we should be careful not to just uh, over victimize people at the same time. So, yeah, of course, people are subjected to border violence, but they are not only subjected to border violence. They also have their own agency and, and hopes and other things in their life than just border violence. Yeah. That's an excellent point. I was going to actually mention that. I think that agency does get neglected sometimes in these in these circumstances where, um, you know, asylum seekers or migrants or precarious migrants are either seen as, you know, vulnerable um, oppressed or um, the other, you know, very right wing fascist rhetoric, which is, of course, you know, that they are, um, you know, criminals or potential potential to do something dodgy. Uh, so that becomes sort of the conflation point. I was also going to mention in relation to the first question that um, I think it's important not to see um, this whole notion of single men as just being heterosexual single men. They, they could be gay, they could be trans, they could, uh, you know, um, you know, have different, you know, um, identities beyond this whole single man or, or this notion that they're single men, but they've got families or, or they have a wife or something. So I think that sometimes gets neglected because there is this immediate push to, to see or view these individuals from a very um, heterosexual position. Um, so I think, yeah, um, on that note, I'm sure um, Malizia and Carolina would agree with me. There is another um, question in the chat. Um, uh, from Marta, nationality as a basis of vulnerability, how dichotomy of Ukrainian refugees versus other uh, people seeking safety in Europe is reflected in EU and in the Balkans? Who wants to take that? I can go maybe because so I think that, you know, I'm from the Czech Republic and uh, definitely like in Eastern and Central Europe, these narratives were like completely opposing but it was also because uh, in Czech Republic, for example, or in Eastern Europe, the hugest minority were Ukrainian people. So it was also personal for many people. Of course, there is a, the notion of uh, nationality and Europeanness and whiteness and so on. But also there are some other practicalities and history that play into that, that most of the people in especially uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe, they knew some Ukrainian people. So they were coming to pick up refugees at the borders, but usually they knew who they were going to pick up and host uh, for a temporary time because these were families of people who they work with and so on. And also the history, it's quite important to stress because many, especially Czechs or Eastern Europeans, they felt that what happened when Russia started uh, trying to occupy Ukraine that resembled so many of the memories of tanks, you know, of course, on very different scale. Uh, in most of the Eastern European and Central countries, there was no war like that is happening right now in Ukraine. But the first weeks of the occupations, the scenes were quite similar when the tanks were trying to enter Kiev. So there were some other things and uh, factors that played a role and they keep playing. However, I have to say that the mood against Ukrainians uh, or around Ukrainians is changing. Uh, in Czech Republic, it's changing quite drastically. Uh, people are not so welcome as they were in the beginning. And uh, I mean, there has been huge kind of disagreement that why Ukrainians get aid if so many Czechs or Eastern European people have uh, living in poverty. So it has been comparison of who gets more aid from the state. And the mood is changing right now. Uh, Malizia, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I agree with everything that uh, Carolina said. Here in Serbia, we didn't have such a high numbers of refugees from uh, Ukraine. A majority of people who came from Ukraine to Serbia are people who are either in mixed marriages or they have some other uh, links and connections here in Serbia. So they were not really visible to the state system. They were not in the camps. They are not, they don't approach NGOs. Uh, Serbia followed the policy of the EU and also granted temporary protection to Ukrainian uh, refugees. This uh, process of getting the temporary protection was functioning relatively uh, fine in administrative matters, getting the ID card and all of that. 
Um, and most of those people uh, already have some links, some connections to, to Serbia. So they um, relatively easily find an accommodation and jobs and, and other, other things. They already have some support uh, system here. Uh, Serbia, when it comes to the state response, Serbia um, designated one camp, which was newly renovated only to Ukrainian uh, refugees. Uh, this camp is in city Vranje, relatively close to the border with Macedonia, so on the south of Serbia. Uh, the camp is brand new and currently is hosting, I think, around 30 or 40 people maybe who, who are there. Um, most of them are still thinking whether or not they should stay here or potentially go to some other uh, country in Europe. Um, there is a very visible discrimination between Ukrainian refugees and other refugees coming from other countries. Um, majority of all, almost all organizations that are providing any kind of assistance to refugees, almost all of them are present in this camp. Everybody wanted to work with uh, Ukrainian refugees. Um, also, a lot of um, international companies are donating uh, either money or NFIs to this camp. So this camp was opened uh, not even a year ago in March or April uh, this year when the first Ukrainian refugees came. Uh, and for example, IKEA already donated the full uh, furniture for the whole camp two times. Um, for the second time, when they donated the furniture, uh, Commissariat for Refugees and Migration, the state authority running the camps, actually brought refugees from Syria and Afghanistan who are accommodated in the camp in the nearby uh, city of Preshevo. They drove them to, to this camp for Ukrainian refugees to be basically a free labor um, force to uh, bring all the furniture out, to uh, put together the new furniture, to bring them in. They were not paid for this, of course. Um, so definitely there is, there is a very big uh, discrimination. Other also local companies who are producing uh, sweets and stuff like that, toys as well, uh, donated some amount of their products uh, only to Ukrainian refugees, only to this camp, but they excluded all other camps and all other children and people in need. Um, also, the state open info center here in Belgrade, which is only for Ukrainian refugees, where they can get information how to regulate their uh, status here and how to get the residency. Uh, with all information information printed, uh, but only in Ukrainian and Russian language. And this info center doesn't provide information to other refugees and people on the move. There is no available information on Arabic or Farsi, Pashto or any other language. So definitely the discrimination is very, very visible. Sorry, if I can just also jump into it with one more anecdote. Uh, I, for example, in Czech Republic, I had neighbors when I was doing a huge donation of blankets, especially, and the clothes for refugees in Bosnia and Herzegovina, of course, for most of the refugees that were coming from a uh, non European context. Uh, many of my neighbors rejected it and even laughed and said that uh, they would rather burn their clothes and blankets than give it to Arab Muslim people. And the same populations were very much, you know, do, having open door policy for Ukrainian, Ukrainian refugees, hosting them in their even private homes. So absolutely, that highlights, you know, the uh, completely different responses that we know right now, that they are different, uh, even in the law, as, as Melissa mentioned. I think it's also interesting. I mean, I think the sort of, I know that... Um... Peter X. Happy has, has written a bit about this um, around like the um, the counterterrorism discourses and the combination of counterterrorism and migration policy, especially from the EU side. Um, I don't know if, if you've read some of his of that work from him, uh, Carolina. Um, but it's 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 actually interesting because you can kind of see that also um, in Turkey, for example. Uh, in not necessarily um, the counterterrorism, I, I wouldn't be able to talk more about that. But I think in terms of the society, in terms of the media in Turkey, in terms of how they view Syrians, but also um, 
the amplified Islamophobia that's happened as a result of that, you know, especially in regards to Syrians and in, in regards to Arabs in general. Um, I, I think it's kind of interesting, but also, yes, I don't know if you, if either of you wanted to come uh, talk about it or have any thoughts or. No. Uh, sorry, Sana, I was reading the, reading the questions and sorry. responding to something in the comments. I wasn't sure. I thought you were talking to Melissa, but no, uh, I, <laughs> no it's I, I, but I, I think it's 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 fascinating how um again I mean um something that I've been looking at into is but you know for example in Poland, um during the war on terror, the, actually the beginning days of the war on terror, um twenty years ago, I mean they had um extradition camps, um, there were CIA camps inside um, uh, Poland, I also believe Romania and uh, Albania where there were torture centers. And so I think there's this idea that, you know, um, the West, um, whether it's the United States, whether it's the UK or EU in general can basically use Eastern Europe and the Western Balkans as sort of like a, a, a containment area to dispose of you know, um, they're de undesirables, essentially. And I think you would agree with, well, maybe you have more to say on that, but you've already said enough. <laughs> Melissa, do you want to go with that? And also, I think there is one more question from yeah, there is directed to you. So you there was also this one question that was skipped from uh, Catherine Cassidy up uh, about detention centers. I apologize, Catherine. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank so, you. Um, yeah, Catherine writes, thanks so much for the talks. I have learned a lot, as Sanaz said. I have a question from Malizia on the detention centers. I wonder about the legal framework that enables the use of detention. Has this, uh, has, um, this uh, developed um, as a response to EU funding, collaboration, and how it relates to existing or not infrastructures in Serbia for uh, detain and deporting people on the move. Also, I wonder um, about who the operating, who was operating these centers. Yeah. So, so I, will, I will answer that question first. Uh, so when it comes to detention centers, we have uh, three detention centers right now. Uh, one is here in Belgrade. Um, they expanded the capacities uh, of this one detention center. And then last year, we have two new detention centers, one in village uh, Plandiste that's close to the Romanian border and one in city Dimitrograd, which is close to the Bulgarian border. Uh, these new two new detention centers were built from scratch. Uh, so it's a completely new facility. Uh, officially, both of these new camps, both of these new detention centers, they have capacity of 100 places, but what we hear from some uh, unofficial uh, data is that very often they are uh, over the capacities. Uh, when it comes to the legal framework that enables the use of detention, um, Serbia has two laws that enable uh, for foreigners to be detained. One is a law on foreigners. And this is applied for people who don't have a legal residency here, which means people who haven't applied for asylum. And this one is being used more, um, more often. And the second law, law on asylum and temporary protection also uh, regulates that people who are in the asylum procedure can also be detained uh, in some specific cases. At the moment, because majority of people, Serbia did detain asylum seekers as well in the past, but at the moment, uh, almost nobody is in the asylum procedure. So more than 98% of people who are in Serbia, they're not in the asylum procedure. So currently, at least to our knowledge, uh, nobody's being detained based on this law. It's usually the law on foreigners and it gives a very wide uh, and a lot of options for uh, a lot of legal grounds for detention. So for example, if a person doesn't have a passport, uh, if it's not, uh, if the police is not able to determine their identity, they can be uh, in detention. If they pose a threat to the public uh, safety, but it's not really explained what, what that means, how you're imposing the threat. Um, so the police uses this quite widely. 
uh, Serbia changed its both law on asylum and law on foreigners in 2018 to align with EU directives. However, uh, the law on the foreigners when it comes to detention and deportation procedure is really not in line with the EU directives. We wrote about it in our report for 2019, which is available on our website, where we compared the, um, how deportation procedure is regulated in Serbian law and how in EU directives. So people who are being, for example, people who are being detained and who are waiting for deportation, uh, they don't have a right to free legal aid, uh, so practically they cannot um, fight this, this decision. Uh, very often, almost never, they don't have uh, interpreters, so they don't realize what is happening. Very often they don't understand uh, what kind of detention this is, if it's a criminal detention, if it's administrative detention, they don't realize why they're there, how long will they stay there. Um, so it's practically like a black hole. None of the NGOs have access and none of the NGOs are going to detention uh, centers. So it's quite unclear of, of what is happening there. Um, this administrative detention can last up to six months. Um, so it can be uh, proclaimed for 90 days and then prolonged for another uh, 90 days. And also in the last couple of months, we know that Serbia also started uh, deporting people back to Bulgaria based on the readmission agreement. So a lot of these people who are in detention centers are waiting for uh, this readmission agreement. We uh, found some articles that might may suggest that people are also being uh, deported back to the countries of origin, but that is quite, quite unclear. We uh, tried to get some information through the official sources by uh, sending the official request to ask for public data for some statistics uh, from the Ministry of Interior, but we didn't we didn't get uh, any response. We actually got the response saying that they don't have this this type of uh, statistics, but we didn't get any any specific numbers or or information. So I think I answered everything. Uh, who is operating these centers? The Ministry of Interior is operating all three detention centers. Thank you, Milizia. I think Marta has also had a question. Um, it's around, uh, I'll read it off. Serbia has a special visa policy in comparison to the EU. People from countries deprived from entering EU can come uh, to Serbia. Serbia visa policy is targeted as one of the main reasons for the increase um, unwanted migration to the EU. Milizia, can you elaborate on this? Yes, so definitely uh, this was a hot topic in some of the countries in the European Union, especially in Austria and Germany. We are also uh, getting, um, receiving um, requests from journalists on a weekly basis, both from Austria and from Germany, who want to, to come here and also to yeah. ask for our um, perspective on this issue. Uh, Serbia does have a visa-free regime, which uh, did cause uh, increased number of people coming from uh, specific countries, especially Tunisia, Burundi, uh, India, Cuba, and uh, Egypt. Um, and then this was presented as the main reason why uh, there is an increase in the number of people on the move and asylum uh, applications in the EU. But however, uh, with through our statistics, so the people that we reach on our uh, field visit, uh, people who are coming from this um, visa-free uh, countries make only 90% of the people that we reach. Yeah. Still majority of them are coming from Syria and from Afghanistan. Uh, so it's definitely not the Serbia's fault of creating refugees and importing refugees to uh, to the European Union, uh, the, the main uh, fault in this increased number. It's definitely the situation in the countries of origin, the situation in Afghanistan and in Syria, and also the political situation and economic situation in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, who are also uh, causing Syrian refugees to leave this country and to migrate for the second time towards the Europe. 
Yeah, just uh, want to add on that of those 19%, 13.5% uh, are from uh, or were from uh, Tunisia and other countries uh, were basically, you know, 1%, 1.5%. And uh, then uh, we also, you can also, I found the article in, in Belgium where they are saying uh, like very, how, how to say, very like sensational. sensationally, like there is nine times more uh, asylum seekers from Burundi uh, this month than last month uh, in, in Belgium. And then you see that number now is 275 and it was 35 the month before. I mean, if Europe will crash because of that, then, you know, it's it's you know it's, it's just uh, a false accusation and i mean i think that european union is is using any 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 situation like that to to let's say switch the the attention of citizens of eu to to some someone else who can be blamed for things that they don't do right and for for you know the whole situation with the uh, with the financial crisis and uh, you know everything about what is happening, so I mm -hmm. think that that was the main, main thing. But also as an excuse of further externalizing its borders, from yeah. further uh, protecting the borders with this explanation: okay, these are all economic migrants who are coming legally to Serbia, who are being um, tricked uh, into going towards the European Union. So then it's fine if we build the fence and, and also, if we do the pushbacks and yeah. violence and, and everything that uh, follows. And also, for example, uh, those people from Tunisia, which were like the, the major group in this 19%, uh, very so many of them were families and were women and, you know, were forced to, to, to do the worst uh, job First jobs there and had 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 I mean they they really was in very 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 bad situation there and uh, you know you you just uh, how to I don't know how to to express it uh, I mean Europe just uh, just cut the the chance for them to maybe to maybe find uh, some some solution because Europe was first the the one who stole everything from those countries and then not giving anything back so you know that's that's why they are poor and that's why they can be called economic migrants because they are coming to you know to the places who stole from them and uh, and in in where where they can maybe maybe make some some decent life i mean yeah that's I think it's also kind of interesting to to kind of note, and I'll get to, I think uh, I'll, I'll have Catherine's point be the last one, um, is that um, when we talk about um, fleeing war, fleeing violence, we don't realize that economic violence is a part of this. For example, um, I'm Iranian, uh, there's been ongoing sanctions in Iran, and that has led to um, a number of, you know, uprisings and, and riots from, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020, up, you know, now um, with, of course, what's happening in in Iran at the moment, which women and uh, have been violently pushing back against uh, state violence uh, for their bodily rights. But I think people have forgotten that the US backed sanctions in Iran um, have had a, a number of difficulties. It's, it's actually led to a continual brain drain from the country. And, and then, of course, you know, in Afghanistan, you have um, US sanctions in Afghanistan, which, of course, yes, you have the Taliban and the, the, the switch was made. But you know, you there's no aid going into the country. It's very difficult. There's no there's uh, you know the uh, the um, Afghanistan's currency in, in some respects with the U.S. backed sanctions have been frozen. So again, it's been hard for you know the country to actually sort of live, you know, survive, and and that put, puts people into economic precarity where they have no choice but to leave as a result of these issues. And then I think um, I think again, I mean that. I mean, to kind of not the extreme example, but I mean, um, I was reading an article about what's happening in Bosnia Herzegovina, but also in Serbia, there's a lot of depopulation happening at the same time because there's a continual brain drain going to Europe. So again, people are trying to, you know, leave 
Bosnia Herzegovina or Serbia to go to Europe, go to Germany, go to England, go to you know wherever for jobs because they can't find anything, um, and that's become a huge problem. That you know if this depopulation, you know, and this uh, escalation of it continues, then what's going to happen to many of these towns, many of these areas? So I think I'll end um, on uh, Catherine has a point. Um, I also had a comment for Carolina. The point is about the different uh, intensities of border violence. Examples sometimes fast, speculative, extraordinary, and other times slow, almost um, reparably, um, irreplaceably is really important. Making the connections between these as a complex of violence after racial pain is important when we situate violence in um, embodied everyday um, experiences. Do you have anything to add to that? Sorry, it's just the one last thing I wanted to add is also that when we look at the Frontex statistics of their interception of our operations, what is not really discussed is that in some of their statistic stated that they also intercept the nationals of Kosovo, Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and uh, of course, these were often not classified as like included into the statistic of pushbacks or denial of entry and so on. But of course, like the local populations themselves uh, were navigating uh, not the same practi practices, but were swept into the fight against so-called illegal migration. Uh, so again, something that is quite domestic is to be acknowledged. It's not just against um, refugees or migrants from uh, Middle East or, or North Africa and, and Asia. Do you have any, any any other points, Carolina, to um, Catherine's point? No. All right. Oh, it is, no, it's just uh, thank you for the comment. <laughs> I mean, I'm yeah. not going to prolong it. I think that it's nice comment. And, and yeah, I, I agree that it's quite important to capture that, not just as the visible and brutal and the direct force, but also uh, other instances of violence that are equally occurring at the borders. Yeah, okay. uh, I had uh, one thing, uh, Sanaz, now when we were when we started uh, speaking about uh, also economic violence and that it, that it is normal to be economic migrant, especially refugee, especially if your country was destroyed, you know, in the ways that those countries were destroyed, how can uh, those systems even recognize ecological, you know, climate migrants? That is yeah. the next question and, you know, uh, is there cases of that and how is that working? I mean, because we, I never met on the field anyone like that. And it is already a topic for, for let's say, five to 10 years that I know of. Maybe it's even much longer, but. Oh, I think it's, I think it's happening now. I think maybe it's about the, I mean, uh, you know, again, the other forms of violence aren't really accounted for. And um, yes, you know, um, ecological violence is happening. And of course, devastation is happening. So I think we'll say, yes, that's a, that's a big problem. And it's still, and it's, and, and it's contributing to a lot of the migration flows as well. So I think we'll end on, on, on that note, because it is, um, we've just three minutes passed and I said 7.30. So it's 7.30 my end, it's 8.30 your end. Um, Milici and Vuk. Thank you so much, Milici and Vuk, for joining us from Click Active. Um, uh, this was a, a really excellent talk. Um, Carolina, thank you again. It's so wonderful to have a colleague um, at Northumbria who's passionate about these issues. Um, and we've got a few. We've got, of course, Gwyneth and Catherine as well. And I'm very happy to have like all of us together who talk about borders and ways of abolishing border regimes. So again, thank you, everyone. It's an excellent discussion and hopefully we can do this again.